不是说开视频还是开启视频嗯开启视频开视频开始就有了分开了视频那个就是现场有啊直播现场另一路的观众介入有现场发口罩你是摄像头开了吗不是他这个在线上看不到的嗯但是从那个看对他从里面装进去 Okay, uh, good evening, all the students and uh, all the special guests, including uh, tonight, we have um, uh, Professor Li Xichao and uh, Professor uh, Esther Lawrence from UVA. I think it's it's great uh, uh, honor for us to have uh, Professor Li Xichao to give us a lecture tonight. So this is a lecture series, actually, um, uh, uh, it's a pandemic uh, week. Uh, especially uh, the topic is uh, the doctor consortium. Actually, this is the uh, uh, 13th year for the Digital Futures event. And uh, uh, we have morning session and uh, 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 evening session. So tonight, this is the second lecture for the evening session. And last night, uh, we have uh, Andrew Witt from Harvard GSB gave a fantastic lecture and make a hot discussion afterwards. And this morning, I received the, the email from Andrew. He just told me he had his fantastic experience and had a discussion with the students last night. So it's a great, uh, uh, it's a great lecture. Uh, hopefully, you like it. And I think uh, I would like to briefly introduce uh, uh, the, all the lectures and uh, uh, we invited the prominent um, professors from other world every year, 
And this year, uh, actually, the, uh, the morning session, uh, six lectures, all from Professor New Leach, uh, uh, whose topics on the uh, camouflage revisit based on one of his books uh, published by MIT Press. And, um, and the, the evening session is actually really uh, impressive, including uh, Andrew Witt, including tonight, uh, Professor Yishi Chao. And also uh, tomorrow evening, we have Alejandro uh, Polo, who is the former dean of uh, Princeton University. Tomorrow will be online. And uh, the day of tomorrow will be uh, Alfie Mangus. And I think uh, last time he made lectures three years ago. So it's really special for him to be coming back again to give us in the lecture. And um, uh, Anthony Picon received actually the Digital Future Fellow this year, uh, led by the Shanti members. And we have uh, Professor uh, Anthony Picon and Professor Kulebo, both of them got the fellowship uh, for Digital Futures this year. So right now, it's great news. We have seven um, fellows uh, uh, for Digital Futures. And uh, last but not least is uh, Professor Mario Kappel. Uh, he is the representative um, uh, uh, theorist uh, of uh, the digital in architecture. Actually, he feel very happy to give lecture again. Last year, he gave another lecture, but this year, uh, come, again, come back again. So this is the, the brief introduction for the, the lecture series this year. And uh, also, this is a PhD process. So I briefly introduced the, 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 the grading system, actually, based on the tendency and also the past performance. If uh, you engage more to the uh, discussion, would be appreciated. And also uh, followed by the final review, which is uh, like uh, two some words, um, ethy, uh, the words ethy, uh, illustrated with the case citation and reference. And we'll be welcome to turn in uh, by the end of uh, the July the 3rd, uh, 2023. So this is for all the PhD students. And also welcome all the, um, uh, tonight we have a lot of uh, special students from the University, university lecture series. So uh, it's, it's great you can take practice from this process. I think it's a great opportunity tonight to have Professor uh, Ishchao. And uh, the manifesto for architecture future futures, ADF, is actually we, we, we are trying to build a, a sharing education uh, content, and an education platform accessible for all the, uh, uh, the, the students and um, actually the architects of the world. To, to uh, try to study, reassemble your, lab, your, your knowledge based on this platform. So uh, this is a growing uh, digital platform. Actually, we make promote international collaborations um, about a broad range of contemporary issues in the discipline of architecture and social fields with a particular emphasis on the latest computational design and collaboration technology, and also including the philosophy and theory as well. So uh, we, we would like to address the broader ethical and social issues. We're thinking on why we implement or learning such kind of technology things. And we should concern the environmental problems, concern, concern about the, the SDG and uh, sustainable development problem. And uh, this is highly uh, 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 encouraged all the students who can particularly keep your thinking on the lectures and also on the evolution of what is happening uh, surrounding us, including, uh, I think, the political, uh, environmental, and a lot of the issues uh, in this, based on this platform. And actually, every week we have a, a, a special uh, a lecture uh, sequence um, online day around the world, actually organized by the European team of uh, Active Futures, and also uh, including the American team, including the uh, Chinese team, so every uh, 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 Friday night, we'll have a, a lecture um, a sequence. So welcome, if you're interested in that, welcome to, to join us. Uh, <clears throat> as well as uh, YouTube and Bitability platform, actually we we'll up upload all this lecture sequence by sequence uh, to the YouTube and Bitability platform. You can reassemble all these lectures as a knowledge system by yourself, actually, uh, with I think the most impressive and representative uh, 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 academic uh, professors, uh, architects all over the world. Uh, over the past 10 years, you can find very interesting topics. I think it's a learning platform. And uh, um, one way going even further, I think will be passive 
uh, based on so many uh, thinkers who theorists and uh, uh, emails uh, to, to give us so many uh, impressive uh, lectures online. So that's the things that we uh, try to build um, on this uh, digital future platform. Uh, briefly introduce that. This is actually the, the participants over the past uh, uh, 13 years from all over the world, actually uh, the advisors, uh, professors, and also uh, the students, architects. Uh, uh, it's really uh, uh, interesting when we're traveling to Europe and traveling to the States, everyone knows digital futures. Uh, when I, last week I just came back from uh, San Francisco, a lot of people know this platform, and also um, the the chair of um, uh, UC Berkeley told me he used to teach twice on digital future. I, I never known that you know there's too many. I, I never known he teach twice on this platform, but it's very impressive. They admire this uh, uh, sharing this, sharing the knowledge with uh, the other people. I think it's kind of culture or the build up. So uh, this is digital futures. I think and this year, especially uh, uh, over the past three years, I think we engage a lot to the online platforms. We learn a lot from the online workshops. Uh, but this year we try to transfer to the offline. So we have like 23rd um, uh, 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 offline uh, uh, workshops, uh, which we, uh, we organize uh, all the workshops in Tongji. And uh, the advisors, students, I think more than 4,050 students will come into uh, Tongji uh, to participate in this 23rd workshops. And also we have five workshops online as well. So we, we host 28 um, uh, um, by Tongji and also uh, Hefei Tongyi uh, Dashi uh, is another uh, university. We will, they will organize another more than 10 workshops Afterwards, after we, we finish, and uh, Professor Nia Leach also has around 38 workshops uh, outside China, uh, India, in uh, uh, Arab and, and, and in South America as well. So it's totally like we still this year we have like uh, uh, 80 uh, uh, workshops around the world. Uh, so that's the, the brief uh, uh, overview of the, the, this year's event. Uh, uh, last year we Based on the digital platform, we uh, uh, start, we launch uh, a journal named Architecture Intelligence. So we already published two issues, and uh, the third issue will be published in July. Actually, we already uh, have like 40 at this uh, internationally invited, uh, 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 very uh, uh, representative uh, or prominent uh, professors around the world. So also, uh, we want to send an invitation to Professor Li Xiaoqiao to give us like a commentary and uh, essay uh, for the next issue. I think it's like uh, the new things, new ideas and new philosophy uh, if, uh, to the, the community. I think, uh, thanks for that. So architecture intelligence generally uh, focus uh, on the three scenarios, including the smart habitat, virtual habitat and the spatial habitat. So, uh, and also we make research, scientific research and all the theoretical thinking on how uh, 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 life cycle, including the simulation, optimization, construction, operation, process of architecture, also uh, uh, process plan, including architectural design, civil engineering, environmental engineering, computer science, social science as well. So uh, welcome, uh, you publish your future research on this platform. And then we go to Professor Li Chao, uh, who is the Whedon professor from University of Virginia. I will briefly introduce because uh, I actually was invited to make uh, uh, to, 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 to be a um, uh, Thomas professor 2019 teaching UVA and uh, I met Li Chao there. I think it's a great experience to know uh, uh, face by face and directly uh, stay a long time with, with Professor Li and, and uh, Esther as well. So uh, uh, Li Xiao actually is uh, who is born who was born uh, in uh, Hunan province and used to, be, used to study in Tsinghua University and uh, the prominent, one of the best students probably from Tsinghua. And then he go to uh, AA, take uh, his uh, PhD uh, uh, degree, uh, doctor degree from A. He is the, the first Chinese student got the uh, uh, PhD from AA. I think uh, uh, because you know, every, the other students know AA uh, have a lot, uh, very important, 
professor architects uh, from the 80s to 90s, including Ram Kuhas, uh, Jahadid, uh, Akhmangas. I think a lot, uh, uh, actually they are the alumni from AA, and I think Shi Xiao, uh, uh, he uh, used uh, to uh, engage into the, the, the golden time of AA. So I think it's uh, give him a, a great uh, research background from, from the culture of uh, UK. And afterwards, he actually moved into uh, uh, working not only in Hong Kong, but also Singapore for a while, and uh, and, and then uh, to the States and teaching as a reading professor in the uh, University of Virginia. Uh, actually, uh, he is a, a great um, author, writer, and author. Uh, uh, the, the best book I recommend is Understanding the Chinese City. I just gave it to my son today. I think it's a great book. I read uh, several times. I very uh, I think uh, great writing to, from the understanding in English to the Chinese cities. And also in 2009, he published Architecture and Modernization and the Power and the Virtue in 2006. Uh, with uh, Esther Lawrence, he is author of Typological Drift, uh, Emerging City in China in 2022. I just uh, got the, the book today and who is also the editor of uh, Kowloon Culture District in 2014. And uh, with Scott Lash, he is editor of the Theory Culture and Society Special Issue uh, Against Ontology, Chinese Thought, and uh, Pensova Jilin in 2023. So today, the topic from um, uh, Professor Li Shichao uh, will be the generative or biological. Uh, models of architecture. I think uh, it's a great opportunity to, get, uh, uh, to invite uh, Professor Li come to front to give us the fantastic lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip, for that introduction. I um, feel particularly uh, privileged to be here to do my first in-person lecture in China. So um, it's something quite special. And I've been teaching online for years and years, and it's really, uh, it's so different. I know there's a lot of your invited lectures are teaching online. It's so different to be in the same room and you know have the face-to-face -face experience. Um, Today, uh, the topic is generative or biological. I'm going to go through the, maybe some kind of connection, different con connections between models of architecture in today's world versus uh, a much older science, uh, you know, biology. Um, how do we get down? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So um, I, you know, for those of you who are in architecture, you're probably quite familiar with these two terms, morphology and typology. What we don't really think about is that this is, these terms came from biological research and science. Morphology in architecture is more intuitive. It really is a way of using natural forms in architecture happens in all cultures. If you look at architecture, it looks like animal, looks at like plants and so on. So this is an example of a, uh, a plant leaf called a canthus leaf that's used in Greek architecture or, or Roman architecture is still actually used today uh, in a column called the Corinthian column. Um, uh, and, and if you look at the Renaissance European architecture, and here I'm showing you a copy of a Renaissance edition by uh, Cesare Cesariano, uh, 1521. Uh, edition of a Roman theorist of architecture called Vitruvius. And the idea at the center of Renaissance architecture, of course, is to use the human body, its proportion system, as the basis for designing architecture. So that's in a way a kind of morphology, you know, thinking about architecture through shapes. Typology, although similar, but it's actually quite different and it's not so intuitive, but more constructed. Typology, if you think about it, I'm showing you a page from 
a beautiful book, a book that, that, that costed a lot of money and didn't really sell very well. So it was a financial failure, but it's actually an intellectual triumph in the 17th century by the English um, naturalist. You know, this is, we're talking about early science and in the 17th century, uh, people were trying to put things together and understand it. John Ray, who did this book, and it's called The History of Fish. Uh, basically, he started to kind of look at all these animals and they think, oh, they all look the same. And then they start to put, you know, stuff uh, into categories of things. And that's really the beginning of the modern science where we have disciplinary di divisions and so on. So I would really see this as a biological beginning of typology moving into architecture, perhaps like late 18th century or the, you know, kind of early 19th century, for example, in this particular case, the French architect um, and the teacher at the uh, a School of Architecture in Paris, uh, Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand, he is actually famous for publishing two books, one big and one small. And this is the big one. The big one is actually a collection of all the historical styles of architecture, uh, the students loved it. You know, it was really kind of a the book to go to, you know, before the age of the internet and you, you have your information on your fingertips. The students had to go to a history book to understand history. So uh, this was kind of affectionately known as the Le Grand Durand, which is the big Durand, <laughs> uh, which then is made of pages and pages of architectural plans organized based on categories. So you can let square plans, Gothic plans and Gothic, you know, buildings, you know, don't they look like John Ray's fish, right? It really is quite similar. So the little book, which is a summary of his lectures, the little book was visually less impressive, but theoretically much more profound and influential. It's a, a summary of his lectures at the Ecole de Polytechnique in, in, um, in Paris that he started to do this. So it's not really just fish, but more like kind of diagrams, you know, talking about generative architecture, it's kind of becoming generative. And the diagrams are not specific buildings, but they're actually principles of how buildings can be built. So uh, from diagrams, then you look at, you know, on the right and then they become, I don't know, parts of buildings. And then you become a little bigger and then become rooms and connected rooms. And then you become, you know, it kind of becomes bigger and bigger and until you get uh, really kind of <laughs> interesting territory. And so uh, that, that applies to elevations as well. So, so this book gave us a very, uh, incredible history and beginning of typology, which is still being used today. And so much so that actually Esther and I uh, published this book a couple of years ago uh, that Philip uh, just mentioned, it's called Typological Drift. Um, so the biological connection here is in the word drift. And drift is not just run, one day around, actually in biology, drift has a very defined meaning. It really means an accidental event that, that, that resulted in a particular biological distribution. The, the, the classic example would be that a truck, this, imagine there's a bag of bugs of all colors, and then there's a truck running through the bugs. Only the yellow ones survive. So the phenotype is not a result of the yellow bugs who survived, and then thrive, you know, and you think that they are particularly kind of, you know, fit for survival. That's not the case. It was actually a result of an accident, you know, and many, many cases like this in the history of biology and evolution. Um, uh, so, so that's the concept, not the other concepts as adaptation, mutation, and migration, these are the kind of other ways of biological change. Drift is the least um, uh, predictable and the most difficult to account. So we use that concept and to make our lives very difficult. You know, <laughs> we, we did it uh, in the sense that we want to 
uh, understand how cities change with uh, influences from outside. In this case, our imagination is that uh, is that the so-called bottleneck effects or founders effects in the kind of conception of drift uh, came in the form of Chinese culture in the sense of you know when outside influence comes to China and it goes through a bottleneck. We describe that as Chinese culture and we use that um, uh, in many uh, instances to, uh, uh, to, to, as an instrument to understand architecture in China. This is the case of two really interesting examples of William Chambers kind of uh, version of Chinese architecture in England and Shanghai's version of English architecture in Shanghai, that's Timestown uh, elevations on the right. On the left, you see the uh, Chinese architecture. You know, none of them are actually, both of them are not quite correct, um, but somehow I think there was a different kind of channels of, uh, you know, transformation of these cultural forms. So we called it China as Britain's other, you know, this is Orientalism. It's a very typical kind of westernized, westernized way to look at other cultures. And then in on the Chinese side, and we would call it Britain as China's figure, which is a Chinese process of understanding that I, we would call figuration, not othering. You know, these are two very different theoretical concepts. And we went on, you know, in our book, uh, uh, it's unfortunate it's still being approved by the authorities. I hope will one day be available um, in China, but you can order it on Amazon. Can I say that? Um, maybe you can. Um, uh, to, to really then understand a city like Hanbian, uh, which is on the right hand side in terms of how a place was created, not only as a film set, but almost like a real history. We actually took students to Hanbian and the tour guide was interesting. I don't know whether you didn't go there. Oh, so I have some BBA students in the audience. Um, um, it was really amazing that the tour guide in Hanbian was not actually just touring you for a film set, but she was actually describing real history of the, the Qing, Din Qing dynasty. You know, it was like, the, the, so there's a kind of really merging of history with the entertainment and fantasy, which is never the case clearly in say Universal Studio or certainly not at the Acropolis uh, in, um, in Athens. So we went on and we also discussed and talked about um, uh, the idea of the avant-garde house. Again, you know, how that concept went through that kind of bottleneck effect uh, ending up, say, in the Foshogu in, in Nanjing or the Ordos uh, 100 project, uh, which is never quite finished, and also the commune next to the Great Wall. So th there's all these kind of different versions of Chinese design of the avant-garde house, which has never been used as a house. You know, all of them actually use as hotel rooms. You know, the house is a type is actually a, a kind of European American idea of everyday living. You know, the house is a house and here the house is like a, a symbol. So very interesting. And also the idea of using a huge big round shape, you know, like in the uh, Nanhui New Town uh, with uh, Di Shui Hu and also uh, different versions of that round shape. Um, uh, and one of the most incredibly, <laughs> uh, uh, I wouldn't say like uh, shocking, but, but impressive example would be Huashi Village. You know, this is a work that, that we did uh, with the help of uh, Professor Li Hua in uh, uh, the Southeast Dongnan University with students uh, 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 documenting some of the kind of really interesting i really think they are interesting you know and many of them would look at them as kind of weirdly vulgar and you know not architecture but but they are actually really interesting examples 
of how um, kind of figures emerge uh, uh, in the design of the city center, I mean, the, the village center in Huashi village. And this are kind of, uh, you know, emergence of new typologies um, in Chinese cities. And lastly, uh, Yiwu's uh, wholesale market, which is known as the International Trade Center in Yiwu. Uh, you see the, this plant, this uh, axon of the buildings are actually drawn at the same scale. Okay. On the top, you can see that the, probably the first wholesale center in North Carolina is that size. And the next one is actually the Mercantile uh, Mart in Chicago, which is one of the major wholesale markets in the world. And it was that size compared to Yiwu's International Trade Center. Yiwu's International Trade Center is not a shopping center. It's actually a wholesale market with sample products for you to visit. And it has at least 70,000 stores. You know, the EU government says that if you spend three minutes in each store, you have eight hours um, a day. I, I guarantee you won't last eight hours and you're going to drop to the floor, you know, with exhaustion. Uh, you, you're going to spend a whole year visiting every uh, store in the EU. So it's really quite interesting. So, so this is actually our use of typology through the concept of drift, uh, you know, drift through cultures. And there's another kind of biological reference, uh, which we don't really normally think about, it's autopoiesis. Um, autopoiesis has two characteristics. Uh, it is actually a fundamental principle of life, if you think, think about life. It is actually, number one, a self-maintenance in the context of external disturbance, okay? Second is self-reproduction. So that really is the cell division over there. Uh, living organisms change cells all the time, but not identity. So if you think about your body, actually your body, your cells, body cells die and regenerate all the time. Do you become a different person? You don't, right? So you keep that identity while the kind of changes take that. That's autopoiesis. It's actually a miracle if you think about it. So autopoietic structures are crucial to for stability, and this is really what life is uh, is uh, you know very characteristic of life. They emerge from a earlier. You're a biologist and think about biological history. An earlier form of a, a what, what's known as the dissipative. Uh, structure that that cell uh, cells change structure constantly, and that's not going to lead to any sustainable life form. The way we have our lives is a miracle in the sense that there is a stability in us. How does that happen? It's interesting. So that concept then become becomes a very central one in a kind of trend in architectural design recently known, you know, as a parametric design. When I was a student, actually, it was already beginning at the AA uh, with uh, uh, Brett Steele and the whole kind of DRL and uh, uh, design research lab at the AA. And Patrick Schumacher is still there, and he's one of the leading architects today in the world. And he wrote this book and recently called uh, The Autopoiesis of Architecture. Uh, which is a theory that's grounded in uh, the German uh, theorist of social systems, Nicholas Luhmann, uh, who actually sees architecture, I mean, Schumacher sees architecture as a similar kind of autopoetic system, like cell structures. I mean, it's very debatable. It actually, I wouldn't actually agree with that, but then that's what he says, that it is autopoetic because it actually uh, absorbs external disturbances like industrial revolution, like digital technology, but then it doesn't change its identity as architecture, as a discipline of architecture. And of course it can self-reproduce through schools like this, you know, as architectures reproducing schools like this. And sorry, this is some images of, of Patrick Schumacher's work, uh, Zaha Hadid architects. Uh, I just came from Changsha, by the way, and this is the, the, 
the Meishi who uh, asked them to, to go with my mobile phone. Um, so um, that's actually a quick outline of the connection between architecture and biology, uh, historical and current. And this is not you know, all of it, but it's uh, kind of an interesting summary. What I want to note today is that we have something completely different. We have actually vast, num vast amount of data sets and we have algorithms being able to use it. You know, like when you come in and you have your face scanned and we, we're not doing that in Virginia yet. <laughs> I don't know, that will be a revolt at doing that. But anyway, so you have your, so this is a data set that really is beginning to manage the whole, you know, human life. Something is very, interesting that's happening. I want to maybe kind of introduce this topic by uh, an artist, uh, Rafik Anadol, and it's quite interesting. I don't know whether you had him speaking in yeah. the platform. Yes. That, 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 let me take an example here of one installation called the Renaissance Dreams that he put in, uh, the, in, in uh, a Palazzo Strati in Florence in uh, 2022. Uh, uh, it is something that really is beginning to shape a lot of your conceptions of pretty much everything, life, discipline of architecture, art, you know, uh, and, and, and technology and so on. These algorithms that he used, uh, uh, they use um, to uh, train algorithms based on artistic and literary data sets from Renaissance between 14th and 17th centuries, processed through algorithms that become proficient in mirroring the styles of um, and the contents of Renaissance paintings. And it really generates new contents. They're dreaming acanthus leaves, maybe, uh, if you look at that image. Uh, and this was part of uh, Anadol's uh, series of uh, art installations called Machine Hallucinations. Um, it started in 2016 and uh, was basically done using uh, a generative uh, adversarial network or GAN, you call it GAN, you know, uh, DC GAN or P key GAN or style GAN. I think style GAN is probably Kind of currently quite used, and I think uh, uh, Philip has another version. Uh, I'm sure it's going to come in burst into the stage um, with uh, with Mid Journey. Uh, so, so you get this. So these are the kind of dreams. They're actually quite original, uh, pretty interesting art. Uh, you can change your parameters, and you know this is when you dream Renaissance. This is what you dream. Uh, who knows? This is so. Uh, I just want to kind of, maybe not all of them are actually in this area, just want to quickly say that there are kind of two pieces of uh, technology that transforms this area. First is generative adversarial network, and they're set up as a contestation between the generator and the discriminator. The generator creates artificial images based on real images, and its discriminator detects fake images. So there's like a bit like a cat and mouse game of chasing one another so that, so that this process of competition will create in the end, really compelling, convincing, realistic images. So style gang is, uh, is one of them and, and there are multiple levels. And this is known as unsupervised this is not, you know, the, the old way of feeding data is that you feed it from the single source, most likely human feeding data. Um, and this is unsupervised in a way that it is actually kind of contextualized machine feeding itself. Um, uh, this is an image that's done by uh, three engineers uh, from uh, Navidia. I, I just want to use this as an example. If you look at the faces here, most of them are not real. And the real faces is called source A and source B. And you see that on top and the uh, left column. So uh, the process of kind of generating this uh, is called adaptive instance normalization. Um, 
So this is a method of creating artificial images through controlling style parameters, source A, and substance parameters, source B. So in the middle, most of the faces are actually totally artificially generated, perhaps using this uh, gang uh, uh, technique to make it really real. So can you tell the difference? Now it's like, kind, you know, it's, it's quite amazing. So, so source A, you, you can you get the gist, right? How, how it works. So source A can then be set as coarse, middle and fine. It depends on how you control it. And then you get different results. Um, so um, through this normalization and contest, you actually were able to generate, this is kind of visual generation, you know? Uh, I think what's shocking today is, is the chat GPT, which is like a literary textual generation, which is a bit uh, <laughs> scary and exciting at the same time. Uh, so I think we live in the interesting times, I have to say. So Anato recently did, I think it's still at MoMA, uh, installation called unsupervised. Now you understand what the unsupervised means in the sense that, that the algorithms here he used uh, uh, were trained on 200 years of MoMA's art collection. So, so this algorithm is beginning to produce works like this, works like this, and like this. I don't know whether this is kind of a, a Miro or Picasso, and who knows, uh, it works like this, maybe 1930s Impressionism, and uh, pretty interesting. So what we are looking at here, and pretty interesting, is to me that, that biology used to be a metaphor for Duran, but maybe even for Patrick Schumacher, I, I don't know. So there's a lot of kind of metaphorical use of biology uh, in architecture. And today we're actually looking at algorithms becoming biology. Um, I have been wondering why there has been an intense interest in this little book called What is Life by Austrian uh, physicist, is not a biologist, and physicist who took an interest in biology uh, called, uh, written, written uh, Erin um, uh, Schrodinger, who wrote this book in 1944, a long time ago, but pretty interesting, very inspiring little book, very easy to read. Um, uh, maybe because he was a physicist and not a bio biologist. I think that, that, that the interest that now we have in this book is because that algorithms can become so lifelike that we're kind of scared, you know, what is life? Um, uh, excited and scared at the same time. What is life? So uh, let me kind of take you through maybe three really interesting points that he mentioned raised in the book. Um, the first one I would say is the idea of normalization. You know, the, the normalization the, in, the, in, the, in the GAN um, uh, formulation. Um, uh, in, in, and, and also in Adain, uh, uh, adaptive instance normalization. Uh, Schrodinger didn't actually use the word normalization, but I kind of guess that this is what he meant, that he said that an organism must have a comparatively gross structure, meaning very, very big, uh, in order to enjoy the benefit of fairly accurate laws, both for its internal life and for its interplay with the external world. Um, this is totally autopoiesis, and this is to certainly emphasizing the size of things. So uh, if you think about it, the individual atom is actually completely random. It re reacts to heat. For those of you actually you know, in physics and in biology, it actually moves um, uh, randomly, but in great quantities, like the quantity as seven times 10 to the 27 power. This is the average number of atoms in your bodies. Uh, can you, I, I, don't, I cannot conceptualize this, the, 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 
size of that number, but that's the number of atoms you have. Actually, it, it achieves stability. It's amazing. Okay, think about it. Um, so, um, so this is normalization in, in the computer, in the kind of programming language. So what is life? Uh, in a way, you know, life is made of very long strings of carbon molecules. You know, it is the kind of, you know, silicon versus uh, carbon that we were talking about uh, <laughs> with Alex, actually. Um, uh, that Aristotle thought that life comes from a vitalism, like a mysterious force that keeps us alive. Uh, he was wrong, you know, if you actually look at modern chemistry, life comes from chemical transformations through fermentation. So your body is fermenting all the time, you know, some die and some uh, uh, grow and, you know, it's, it's that process. So each carbon has four free electrons that can freely associate, forming incredibly long and various polymers that carry information. Uh, Life is 99% made of six elements um, from bacteria to the human body. You know, like bacteria is, is common. It's the most ancient form of life and it still exists in our bodies. And it essentially is, bacteria are our bodies. You know, it's basically we're made of bacteria. Um, so it's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, phosphorus and sulfur. So the, the point to understand here is that the data sets today, if you think about big data and big model today, is so huge that it really begins to, res uh, to, to uh, resemble that normalization that, you know, that's talked about in biology in Schrodinger. A uh, very interesting thing, you know, aspect of uh, the digital culture uh, to understand. The second principle, that, that was the first principle. The second principle is random mixing. Uh, in computer uh, language, it's really called noise. And you actually need to add noise in this whole kind of process of generating these artificial faces. Um, uh, so Schrodinger uh, kind of talked about that again, not using the word noise, but more like using the idea of this kind of mixing of uh, genes, uh, the chromosomes and that we all have. So, so he, he argued that, that the stunning success of life relies on number one, exact copies of DNA in each cell division. And this is one kind of process called uh, uh, mitosis. And the other second is actually the crossing over of two sets of uh, bacterial uh, uh, information in each generation, particularly through uh, two kinds of generation. Uh, bacterial generation is a kind of, you know, it's, it's not quite sexual production that, as we know it, but it's actually a sexual production, uh, reproduction in bacteria. It's about kind of changing, exchanging genetic information, sections of genetic information in the parents' generation. So our mixing is in the children, but bacteria is actually in the parents' generation. Uh, that's really fascinating to, to understand. So there's a kind of random mixing, um, you know, it's really about the two sets of 23 chromosomes for humans, for instance. Um, uh, but what's astonishing to understand is that they actually make a very tiny part of uh, our uh, molecules in the body, there are a very small amount in the nucleus, in the cell, and it's carried on and divided and, you know, I don't know, mixed. And, uh, uh, but they determine everything of your development uh, in, in, well, not everything, a lot of it uh, in the development of your, your body as, a, as life. So a, a typical DNA information is reproduced 60, 50 to 60 times, and that's not more, you know, as, as life continues. They're starting from the first division of the egg that then made you all of you. Um, so uh, 
I was reading a, a, a biologist at Lane Margulis and Dorian Sagan, who wrote this really interesting book called Microcosms, Four Billion Years of Microbial Evolution. So their kind of story is, is really not about human or human life or, you know, or even plant life, but more like about bacteria, how incredibly amazing the history of bacteria uh, uh, evolved and, and being able to kind of assemble enough cells to form a biological entity uh, like all of us, uh, we call it life. Uh, so that's really an interesting. So that gives us, you know, a lot of kind of things to think about in architecture, uh, about copies and mutations, and particularly memory. For those of you actually in history and theory, uh, history is really about memory, and it's it's a kind of um, uh, memory that has some connection with the biological memory that's in the cell structure uh, itself. Um, so our arithmetic, uh, uh, um, arithmetic uh, normalization approximate this process by producing unsupervised noise. And this that's through genetic mixing um, and leads to a new reality uh, in, a, in my mind, you know, kind of, uh, it, it gives us some kind of insights into understanding architecture history and, and historic preservation in architecture uh, through uh, algorithms. And the, um, uh, the outstanding mathematician Giuseppe Longo uh, uh, I said something that's quite interesting is that biology is a historical science. And I would say that you know, algorithmic or architectures produced by algorithm is also historical because you've got to kind of absorb the data set before you can spit out uh, new content. Uh, so there's a history already embedded in it. Um, and last year uh, we were at a, um, uh, a theory event uh, in uh, <clears throat> Lisbon Triennale. Uh, um, and Esther Lawrence and I uh, were all there uh, presenting uh, some ideas. Uh, and I presented these ideas, ideas of continuity. I thought that it was interesting to put in this context in the sense that if you think about biology, uh, maybe there are actually kind of modes of continuity, uh, you know, as a, a different way to think about history uh, in terms of replication, source dominance, co-dominance, and reverse dominance and replication is very easy to understand. You just copy, you know, like history, like in this bullseye education, you copy a column capital exactly the as as well to the floor. Source dominance is interesting. This is like almost like a Spanish adaptive instance normalization in the sense that this example actually just give you a little bit of context. It's actually a Spanish church in the Bolivian city. Porto Z, uh, which is a weird combination of a Spanish church with local Inca ornament, ornamental schemes and gods and so on. So it's not quite Spanish, it's Spanish and not Spanish. So it's really kind of uh, almost like a kind of a, a style gang that's going on uh, that's really already produced. Uh, so the dominance is, of course, the Spanish church and the kind of um, subservience is the local ornamental scheme. In some cases, it's hard, much harder to decide. You know, in this case, um, it's the, the uh, uh, vernacular, vernacular architecture in Taiping in Guangdong province. I don't know how to really see this is Western or Chinese. Uh, so there seems to be an equal influence. And particularly this village kind of houses is actually now a UNESCO heritage site, uh, you know, village houses with Western architectural details. There seems to be that there's a co-dominance that's going on. And this is an English uh, uh, 16th century English house, which had some Renaissance influence, but not too much, you know, it's really, Kind of half and half, you know. It's you don't. It's like kind of, you don't know which side it is. It is moving. Uh, very interesting to understand. But reverse dominance is something different. It really is uh, 
It happened when, say, uh, English architect Inigo Jones designed this Queen's House in London. He used entirely Italian architectural style, which was really badly suited for the English climate. For example, the windows are way too small. It was really the size of the windows designed for the Mediterranean strong sun and not the English rainy weather. So you really need to go for a much larger window to, to have the architecture make sense. But then that was not the case. It was really kind of his desire to create Italian architecture in England. And uh, one example is interesting. This is actually in Huizhou. You think this is in Austria. This is a Huizhou. It's actually a reproduction of an Austrian town called Hallstatt. Esther is in Austria. We actually went there and had a great fun just to look at the Austrian architecture in Huizhou. Um, uh, so this is kind of reverse dominance in the sense that there's a willing kind of acceptance and recreation of a source architectural style uh, there. Um, uh, one of these years actually went to uh, Georgian Prof. Actually, you have a lot of this, this kind of, uh, I don't know, court. this is a courthouse of Dongyang City, but then you could have been a lot of the government buildings or courthouses in China, which willingly accepted, reproduced, it, you know, although with a lot of flaws, you know, if you look, if you look at detail, nothing actually matches Western architecture, but then somehow, it looks like it. So, sorry, this is a bit of a digression, but I hope you can still keep uh, your attention on the third thing that I took from Schrodinger, which is to me the most important and something that architecture has, uh, or in, you know, kind of certainly digital fabrication has not been able to deal with, is the second law of thermodynamics about life. That the argument here is very important. Schrodinger says that life follows not the law of physics, but the law of thermodynamics. Uh, this is very interesting to understand uh, in the sense that life is a temporary reversal and slowdown of the unstoppable movement of the process towards entropy. So entropy, is the cessation of all activities. Like the moon is entropic because you know it's lifeless. It has really nothing much going, no chemical reaction, no fermentation. Uh, so, so that's entropy. And um, life reverses that. So our event, our life event, of course we're, I mean, I, can I say that we're all going to die? Uh, so that's the inevitable path of life. All life end, but then somehow it regenerates itself through another generation. So there's a process that, that reverses that entropy, uh, which is the law of second law of thermodynamics. Um, so that reversal in, Biological bodies will be absorption, ingestion uh, of other biological materials that keep us alive. We have to eat pretty much three times a day, right? Otherwise, you feel terrible. Uh, so that's really, you know, that's that's in a way we are fighting against the the second law of thermodynamics, which is you know becoming entropic, becoming lifeless. Yeah. So here then involves metabolism. I, you know, this is really quite difficult to, to, uh, 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 to imagine in architecture. I know in architecture, there's a kind of metabolism in the Japanese uh, version uh, in 20th century, but that's really far from dealing with the root concept of metabolism. Metabolism, uh, Schrodinger actually used the, used the word, uh, negentropy, which is the reverse of entropy. So that's what life is about, negentropy. Yeah, it's negative entropy. It's kind of, you know, becoming life against the trend of entropy. Uh, so negentropy is sustained through metabolism as a process. The constant building up and breaking down of molecules, enzymes are crucial in this operation. It's really about fermentation again, uh, creating hundreds of reactions, tiny space of single 
cell. It's, it's like the cell is amazing, it's wonderful. Uh, so this really kind of divides uh, life from non-life. So uh, uh, Margulis would argue that life continues uh, via, via symbiosis. And symbiosis, I want to kind of draw your attention to that CDC image. It's very, very uh, um, enlarged image of a cell structure. You can see that in the middle there's a there's a nucleus, that's where the DNA information is uh, located. And you see that around that, there's a whole set of uh, little organisms. If you look closely, that those organisms actually do not share the same genetic information with the cell. This means that there's actually a network, a city in a cell that exchange information. So those cells that red arrows are pointing to they're called uh, mitochondria, and they're actually energy producing cells. You know, the energy you have in your body is produced by them. Uh, by what? By metabolizing oxygen, which appeared as a deadly poison to bacteria uh, billions of years ago, and it became a source of nutrition. So that's, you know, it's a kind of wonderful story to think about that. So, so uh, Margulis calls this endosymbiosis, and the host cell engulfing the bacterium, instead of digesting it as food, it negotiates a functional relationship that enables the host cell, uh, endosymbiont, to utilize the oxygen in energy metabolism. So in a cell, there's a community of organelles, organelles are just little kind of floating organ, you know, organic matter in a cell that's not the nucleus where the DNA is, is located, but kind of a community, uh, uh, continuity. Um, so they're forming a symbiotic relationship. That's what the kind of symbiosis is, is originally all about. Uh, continuity is both genome mixing and symbiosis. And the story here is, Quite fascinating. Um, I, you know, certainly don't have time to go through all that, but but I think it's, I encourage you to read more on this and um, just to understand. I think what's fascinating is that is that, that she concludes, uh, uh, Margulis, that life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. Um, to me, this is really certainly to a lot of people too that this is a significant revision of Darwin, Darwinian kind of survival of the fittest thesis. This is not about survival of the fittest, but more like survival of the cells, which can really make use of networking of other organic materials in the cell. This is like a little city in a cell. So this is really, I want to put this uh, <clears throat> French philosopher, uh, Bernard Stiegler, who actually lectured uh, a couple of years ago here uh, in this very lecture series, uh, who was deeply concerned about the massive increase of entropy in today's world and a massive scale, uh, technology, material use, and so on. So, so he argued, he said that our era is actually not Anthropocene, but more like Anthropocene, like the time of entropy, you know, we're kind of <laughs> heading towards the lifeless uh, planet. Um, so, so he wants to argue that there is actually a different world called uh, Neganthropocene, which is really to do with reversing that process. Um, he's a philosopher, so his interest is in knowledge, and he said that knowledge is an open system. Uh, he said that there's a lot of kind of digital culture that creates a closed systems uh, of knowledge that are in, in effect uh, entropic, you know, they are entropic. So um, <clears throat> uh, the knowledge production should really be in an open system. It really has to have a capacity of de-automization and that produces uh, negentropy. Um, so uh, 
So this is something that we can we can all think about. This book is actually uh, free for you to download, and it was you know, no copyright or anything. So it would be interesting to to read a little bit. Uh, I want to add that um, that we're facing another kind of deep uh, challenge in terms of you know via biology uh, to think about the generative algorithms is that negentropy needs truthful information algorithms don't we need you know like you know think about it we need truthful information that's why we actually have the kind of morality to be truthful you know to lie is almost universally a bad thing why for algorithms to lie doesn't make any difference so um Truthful information is central uh, to organic life, you know, to life because, you know, health, because of reproduction, uh, because of maybe power that's related to resource accumulation, uh, science, you know, knowledge and military uh, build up and so on. So, so, um, so we're really seeing that the misinformation, which is really one of our greatest challenges in today's social political world, uh, misinformation. The misinformation does nothing to algorithms and it does so much damage to biological life. And we, we have to think about that one. I don't know what the solutions can be, but uh, that's certainly uh, one aspect um, that we need to think about. Um, <clears throat> I have to say that I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a biologist, I'm a teacher of architecture. <laughs> so uh, I I'm interested in all this. I think it's right to have some understanding of this. So I'm actually uh, going to show you how uh, in a studio, uh, I wouldn't say this is a success, but then you know, certainly a, a try um, to uh, put in some of the um, understanding as an experiment. The experiment is a studio, design studio called uh, Ghost in the Algorithm. I want to look at uh, something that's probably not going quite right in the process of producing uh, in, in a positive way, um, producing algorithms. And so it's called Art and Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. It's a hypothetical national gallery of digital art in the National Mall in Washington, D.C. I took students there, I talked to people in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. We did a little bit of a historical preparation to understand the digital term. I think in art, uh, you probably go to this kind of two very popular kind of uh, movies, and one is Blade Runner, and one is um, a Matrix to understand how uh, the digital world has actually produced uh, quite a visible impact on human life. Uh, we revisited um, Marshall McLuhan and, you know, quite insightfully saying that the medium is the message. Um, we also kind of studied uh, Deleuze and Deleuzean. This book is actually very influential in architecture, the fold. Um, the Lucian understanding to me is really an understanding of the rhizomic, the, the kind of networking of things and not uh, hosting, you know, not the kind of, uh, kind of independent subjectivity, but more like understanding everything being connected, a bit like what Margulis was talking about when she said that cells are really about networking and not about being identity being, uh, you know kind of self uh, concerned uh, so that's and also a uh, very interesting architect turned philosopher critical theorist Paul Vivillo through his most fascinating concept called dramology and dramology is the, the uh, the study of speed in a way that, that our life is so driven by instantaneous reaction. You know, you kind of post on your, I don't know, TikTok or, um, you know, social media, everything, or WeChat, everything that you do, that's, you get instantaneous reaction. 
Uh, so, so he would, I mean, he was writing quite early, uh, late 20th century, and he, he called that dramology in the sense that, that, um, that we live in the service of the management process in fulfillment of its own speed and efficiency. Of course, this is growing by, you know, for him, capitalism and the demand of law. And closer to architecture, we also looked at some of the kind of uh, Manuel de Landa's uh, uh, consideration of as the, the idea of assemblage and rather than uh, identities, you know, uh, in, in architecture and, and in relation to philosophy. Um, uh, in theory, um, we were also quite interested in um, uh, Catherine Hale's kind of presentation of cognition. This is quite an interesting concept in the sense that we think that we are the only beings being able to be cognitive, to recognize something. But then what about the sunflowers following the sun? Is that not cognition? You know, what about the computer growth, you know, scanners reading your face? Is that cognition? That that's cognition too. So what she says is that there's unconscious cognition, like your face scanner, and there's conscious cognition, which is us, which are, <laughs> we are able to kind of think about not only what we recognize, but also the very act of recognizing something. So that's kind of that's reflexivity in in philosophy. You know, so it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, I think that's important to understand because then we no longer put a radical divide between a kind of, you know, one form of cognition and another form of cognition. So it's more like spread out. This is a bit like what Stiegler talked about in digital ontology um, in the sense that, that, that you think that we actually have a consciousness or being of individuals. This is actually very typical of Western philosophy that you think that I'm a subject. I think therefore I am. I am, therefore I'm I'm a being, you know. So uh, um, uh, Stiegler says that, wait a minute, you know, it's not quite like that. And we are always part of a technique, you know. Even Plato, would say that language is a technique, the language that we use is a technique that we acquire uh, to become. So we are kind of technologically always already dependent on something without which we cannot be uh, at all. Yeah, there is no being. Uh, one more thing, uh, I know this is uh, kind of adding more and more abstract concepts, but I thought this is really interesting. Uh, in, in Lisbon, I actually met Bernadette uh, Bensard Vincent, who is a, a French uh, chemist and philosopher and chemist and historian of chemical science. I thought that what she talked about was really interesting, the idea of timescaping. Uh, this is another aspect. That, that we tend to use human biological time to measure everything, you know, lifespan, eras, you know, kings and queens, and you know, like, so, so we have this kind of era divide. But she said then, no, I think a lot of things have different time frame that we need to think about, you know, like she, the, the example she gave was very interesting, carbon, has three different time scales. We only deal with one of them, which is really about um, the living organism's uh, relationship to, to carbon. Um, but climate science, carbon cycle, is a cycle of temperature, not time. Uh, geological carbon cycle is based on the scale of one million years. So it's really, you know, so, so 
do not think only with our concept of time, but think about time as having multiple scales. You know, that this is what she calls timescaping. And it's quite obvious in chemistry, uh, you know, because of the, the, the cycles of, you know, atoms and molecules and, you know, the metabolism rate. Of, so they, they actually have a different kind of concept. This is all pretty interesting. Um, I cannot promise you that we're using all this, but actually, but we went through all this theoretical preparations and we started with the installation project. I just want to show you uh, a couple. And this is an installation made by a student, Christopher McDonald. Uh, he was fascinated by misinformation. You know, this was actually quite close to January the 6th, uh, you know, kind of attack of the Capitol uh, in the name of the Constitution uh, of the United States. So he actually made a book of the United States Constitution like this, but with a thickness. So the thickness actually then give him a chance to see how the Constitution, uh, this is just the 10 amendments in the beginning, it's called Bill of Rights, um, that they can be actually misread because of the, the letters actually go through and you actually can, uh, I don't know how much misinformation you can read from this, but it's actually hard to read, uh, certainly. Uh, it's pretty interesting installation. I really like the, um, or it's publication. Uh, so he made that. Uh, another student, uh, Jia Yun, actually used, she just spent a lot of time trying to learn style again. <laughs> and then she made a portfolio for herself. And I hope she didn't present this with her job applications, probably won't get any jobs. But anyway, she, she presented this as an installation as her portfolio, you know, like presented like a book. Uh, it's quite fun, you know, funny project, but also fun project. Uh, here's another one, Zihe, who did, uh, uh, who wanted to think about, you know, like we spend so much time on social media, where are our fingers, what are we doing? You know, so she actually put a film on top of her mobile phone and spent an entire week tracing her fingers movements in different social medias, um, in different social media platform. And I made this installation. So she took the film out and then changed a new one every hour. So this is, you can see that Tuesday, Wednesday, so there's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and there's a whole entire week's work of uh, kind of, you know, surfing. I mean, your phone is actually full of fingerprints, um, but we never know where, how, you know. So she called this my digits, um, referring to the digital culture, but then it's actually, <laughs> so I thought it was funny. Uh, I thought it was quite a beautiful project. Um, Anyway, so that's that. So then we had reviews and blah, 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 blah. And you know that you just have your reviews. Um, so the project after this installation is actually a National Gallery of Digital Art. I uh, just want to show you a couple. And this is really about uh, seeding the project um, by Python, um, somehow kind of using uh, maybe like a gang style operation to create uh, many, many seeds. So she selected this five seeds. And then in the end, they, they combined and it became this. And she fell in love with this. Uh, sure. And, and then it was put on site. So, so this seeds perfectly worked out, you know, as a project is entirely disrupted by site. You know, it's like completely, then she had to redesign everything. In the end, uh, it's kind of a, a interesting kind of, you know, living with that whole process. Um, uh, Ali Ta's project uh, worked on the lines of the DC, you know, the like Washington DC is a, is a city of huge international mall, is a place with huge access and long lines. And, you know, some are really mysterious and some are related to how the eye can see further from uh, places. So she actually then used maybe the kind of DNA her heredity principle of lines and then started to kind of generate 
the plan that's very complicated and it's just then after that she's been days and weeks and trying to figure out how to how to design the building uh, I thought it was quite quite a fun project to look at uh, Ja Yong's project I would say maybe is some kind of south division and she just really rather than kind of seeing the museum as a museum, a building, like we normally go into a building. And she wanted to create this kind of urban cells and like, you know, capable of, you know, dividing and not dividing. So, so that's the whole project um, logic. Anyway, I'm going through this quite fast uh, uh, so, that, so that we uh, maybe have some time for discussion. Um, and to her project, of course, is related to the touch of uh, the screen. But in the end, I, I'm not sure whether I can read this clearly. Maybe you should have another iteration, but then maybe we ran out of time. So here is really about kind of a loop, a zigzag loop and going up and down with uh, being able to uh, touch all the screens and have kind of instantaneous uh, alteration of the digital um, work. And finally, uh, it's uh, Timothy uh, Victoria's project and that um, that's to do with not art as product, but art as production. So he's interested not in a museum, but more like a, a artist residence and something like that. And so he lifted the whole building up and, and started to build um, kind of uh, not only uh, art spaces, but also production spaces. Um, this is some of the joints maybe. So in the end, you can see that, you know, his project is in, in the background there. And uh, I thought <laughs> it probably works somewhat with the monumentality of the national of the Washington DC's National Mall. And this is the ground floor and um, uh, the um, exhibition spaces. But I think more importantly, it's, it's about this, you know, the whole project is really about people being able to live and work and in that whole process of kind of dealing with uh, data. In the end, he did um, like an AR presentation. It was quite uh, interesting that he doesn't really, he didn't do a model, but more like a several, uh, you know, models that you can view and experience uh, both in scale, but also one-to-one. -one. You can actually walk in the building uh, with that a uh, AR goggle. Um, uh, pretty fascinating, actually. <laughs> To, to walk around and you have to experience it. Uh, so to kind of make the whole thing maybe a little bit realistic and we actually went to the National Gallery of Art and presented to their curators and their leadership and then saying that, oh, maybe you should have a gallery of digital art and you know make life a little bit more interesting and be a little bit more update. So we presented our work and then very interested and fascinated. Uh, I have to really express my thanks to Michael Lapthorn and Donna Kirk uh, at the National Gallery of Art, who actually allowed us to see the facilities. And there's a lot of security clearance and all that. But when they saw the, uh, the facilities and we we're quite, um, and they really indulged us in the students who you know, took on this project, uh, to um, suggest that, you know, maybe we can think about the digital art and I'm sure Philip would do, do a very different design, but then um, I work in the field of history and theory. So uh, um, I also want to say that National Gallery of Art still does not have a plan for a gallery of digital art. I think they should. Uh, that's what I was trying to persuade them. Um, anyway, so to conclude, I want to kind of share with this quote from uh, Lynn Magulus and um, uh, uh, Dorian Sagan uh, to really think about um, biology, architecture, algorithms. I really think that algorithms 
in order to kind of not maybe respond to the deep concern of Bernard Stiegler, uh, algorithms should really be more microbial. They're like micro, microbial assemblies. And this, this quote is interesting that, and, and, and they say that real organisms are like cities. Los Angeles and Paris can be identified by their names, by their city limits, by the general lifestyles of the inhabitants, but closer inspection reveals that the city itself is composed of immigrants from other, from all over the globe, of neighborhoods, of criminals, of philanthropists, alley cats, and pigeons. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I think Xu Xiao gave us a profound uh, thinking on the theory of um, um, actually the typology from the typology in biology to, I think it's a post-digital uh, product, productive, pro social productive process, including, I think uh, the three points he, he mentioned, the nomination, I think, which is extremely important right now based on the big data, based on the, the large quantity he mentioned in the uh, in the database, actually, we can we can find which is based on the memory, the information uh, in the history. Actually, could be the profound nomination uh, create creativity process in the future. That's actually a big a paradigm shift. I think from the, the first part of the lecture to the second part. Uh, in uh, I think from the the modern um, uh, uh, modernism is is uh, I think uh, uh, it's from the autonomous process of thinking critical to the uh, 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 classical. It's a starting from, I think, uh, like uh, as um, uh, Shishan mentioned from the typology, and that's a kind of uh, 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 diagrammatic uh, uh, simply, simplification of the original uh, lifestyle or the history actually hidden in the prototype or typology of the architecture. That is kind of a linear, very linear um, uh, evolution process in the history, actually, from the classical uh, era to the modernism. And while it's a big street uh, to the second part, um, uh, 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 Shi Chao uh, actually shift very fast to the digital age. Actually, I think uh, the formation or the generative process actually is totally based on different logic. It is not. Uh, just from the formalism perspective or typology perspective, from the uh, the simpli simplification of uh, of the tradition memory or the tra tradition building typology, it's actually uh, have a big shift from the I think the, the formation process from all the the memory information on the internet. Actually, that's the nomination part. I think it, which is profound, uh, give us a rethinking on how. The database or the thinking is not from uh, memory in the human being's brain, but actually it's from uh, it's kind of based on information from the internet. Uh, the, I think it's big, large quantity information. Uh, actually, the nomination uh, Shishan mentioned actually is totally changed to a different age. I think that's the digital age, or and then the digital age have a very interesting uh, formation rules or methodology. As he mentioned, it, which is the random mixing. Actually, it's a kind of a biological formation process. It's simulating the biological process, but actually, it's totally different. It's kind of a like a, the sequence A, sequence B. Actually, you can find which can uh, uh, produce different kind of mixing. Totally based. It's more than the biological uh, formation process. It's more than that. It's, I think it's to it be interestingly and give us a uh, recreate creativity in the, the form finding. Uh, I think it's more than the metaphysics um, uh, which created in the modernism time. Uh, uh, the diagrammatic thinking is kind of loose uh, simplification from the history. I think it's more than that because it's something new, something created by the new methodology is totally uh, 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 AI, artificial intelligence actually produce uh, a new engine which can help us to, to enhance our thinking skills. 
and also enlarge the uh, the the ways of thinking. I think it's very 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 special actually, which is uh, based on a lot of discussion over the past few years. I think during the COVID, we invited like uh, a speaker to give two lectures uh, from 2019 and 2021. I think uh, he also mentioned very interestingly uh, grammatization grammatization on the memory of human being actually created, gave us a, a new kind of thinking on how to create a new possibility. And the third part, third part he mentioned about uh, the entropy. I think uh, that part is more than digital. I think it's post digital because the, the motivation to generate form is more than just generate the form. It's on the energy and how to make a, the future progress, uh, but that should spend lower energy and I think it's a de, uh, 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 entropy process. I think it's, it's a digital error. So we're thinking on the, the formation, the, the biological thinking. Is. So the lecture is profound um, uh, from the modern to digital age to the post-digital age, is including uh, a lot of different philosophies, a lot of books, uh, very interesting. So I would like to invite uh, it's to, tonight is more difficult compared to last night. I, I think it's more uh, like philosophy, philosophical thinking on a lot of uh, theory and uh, uh, critical thinking on the discipline, actually, how to address uh, our pedagogy in, in the uh, uh, such kind of uh, uh, philosophy transformation as well as uh, the technological uh, the technology uh, transformation age. I think uh, that's a really uh, Big moment and uh, 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 important moment for us to be thinking on such kind of a transformation. So it's, I think that the lecture is very very important to us, uh, uh, and also give, it's more like um, a review on uh, that uh, very interesting theory. Uh, I have a large big um, span uh, over the age. I think it's, it's extremely important to me. Uh, I still need time to swallow, uh, but I think uh, if any questions from the, also we have uh, we have questions from the online, we have more than 80 uh, people. Okay, this is another. And any questions from students, welcome. And also welcome, we have Professor Ruin Yi also join us, and Professor Zhang Haoqun uh, also join us. So thanks for coming. So Anna Passion is welcome to the board. Um, <clears throat> why are you thinking uh, your questions? Uh, I, had, I have to say, yes, it's difficult, but our times are difficult times. And we know that there's so much technological development, but also so many crises of how life and human life and planetary life should be. Um, the challenges are very deep and profound. And there is not that I have nothing else better to do. And, you know, uh, it, to me, this is actually uh, very important to think from ground up, you know, really think about uh, the most fundamental frameworks and questions about uh, disciplines, about knowledge and about, you know, architecture, of course. And so um, I just, you know, want to encourage you that, that uh, don't be, uh, you know, um, put off by the difficulties of thought. And if you actually, you know, Philip invited a lot, a lot of the and Mario Capo, you know, like, you know, all these people that, that you're going to listen to, they will talk about these things. And I think, uh, I think there's something suspiciously um, not right if, you know, someone gives you something that can be swallowed in, in a few seconds. It really means that there are certain things that we haven't really thought through. Um, yeah, I have uh, some more. Uh... The PhD student, like Melody, because to make a lot of research in AI, you have any questions, uh, Professor Ms. Charles? Uh, really 
to understand the architecture and cities and communities and the body. And I really impressed by your sentence about evolution is more like mm -hmm. really Oh, should be, should be, yeah. yeah. Should be. So after I read your PPT, um, I understand it as like this. In your understanding, it's more like an undermining process. Yeah, you you understand life as a cover uh, chemistry process and biological process. But sometimes I'm really thinking about what do you think about to overmining the life you need to about to think about. Um, Feminism as, as a way to, I mean, how do you think about the theories of life, the mm -hmm. meaning of life, how to understand it, and how to use that new way of thinking to yeah. think yeah. about and yeah. Well, I, I think I have to say, I really would encourage you to read uh, um, Margulis and Sagan's book, uh, Microcosms. Uh, it's a pretty interesting book. And they would argue that that um, the meaning of life is actually kind of uh, our overt expression of the necessity of life to reproduce itself, you know. so. Uh, I want to say that truthfulness is one of the kind of deep necessities for life. You know, misinformation is very dangerous. So, uh, uh, but they're kind of, they have a much more elegant way of describing this. And, and it's very interesting that they see life, we see life as, kind of sacred and inevitable, but then they would argue that this is actually part of a microbial uh, evolution. It's just that temporarily large amount of molecules assembled together and it made us, but then these microbial organisms will continue to exist without us. Um, so, um, I, I, I don't want you to take it as a kind of nihilistic understanding of life and world and spiritual values, um, but it is really important to understand why life exists. Why is it so delicate? You know, it is really a very temporary moment of the stoppage of the process of entropy. You know, it, we move towards that direction, it's inevitable, but we stop it, you know, and organisms kind of become energy producing, heat producing, animate uh, things, yeah. which is us. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that the lesson to you know take is is that is that don't you know I wouldn't really take the spirituality of you know one's subjectivity without thinking about the larger picture of the existence of uh, life, you know? So it's really that work against entropy that we all need to put in. And uh, I think technology is accelerating uh, in some ways the process of entropy and we should all be worried about it. And also misinformation. Yeah, don't uh, I think this is one breaking exploration on the whole new system. Since the the So I have a question. Uh, the first uh, for uh, Professor Shijian. Uh, is there any difference in the digital in the way that digital is actually on? And nowadays, is there anything like what you call a script? Yeah. What kind of in 
Yeah. Well, that would be noise. Uh, yeah, it's less control. You know, there would be noise in the in the process of normalization. Yeah. Well, it's less controlled, and I really feel that somehow we don't have enough intention in the writing of the codes that actually can produce a level of sophistication that's more harmonious with life, you know, um, not yet. Noise is, is, that, is that drift uh, somehow, but then drift in the biological world uh, works in the interest of life, I still think, yeah, I think it's, you know, but, but noise in algorithms, I don't know. So that's really something that's quite a, uh, quite a, quite a challenging question. Yeah. 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 I think uh, the noise is, is a, a competition idea actually which, uh, in the generative design, which is totally different to the rule based or grammar based uh, yeah. uh, formation code. It's, it's more about uh, a new kinds of weight that based on different kind of, um, uh, uh, I think you, you use the word. Uh, um, uh, 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 it's kind of a different way of uh, the images. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the noise is giving you the new possibility for create a new formalism. I mm -hmm. think it's mm -hmm. totally a new uh, big shift mm -hmm. uh, to the new formalism. Mm -hmm. I think you can take a look at the review because we review it here. Still, all most of the thinking methodology actually is in modernism time because you can see it's program based, it's functional based. Uh, we have a very strict uh, professional based training process. But actually, if you are looking from the other perspective, it's totally jumping from this age to that age. The creativity actually will give you a more, uh, a more interesting possibility. I think uh, the pedagogy is slow for the uh, most of universities around the world. Uh, but Shi Chao actually, I think, he actually point out this big shift. I think it should be from a perspective, uh, perspective of philosophy and the creativity. And also, I think computational design, actually, the noise is kind of weight thinking on the mm. uh, different uh, parameters, actually, yeah. different yeah. genetic uh, yeah. uh, aspects of different objects. So we should be thinking on what is object, what is mm -hmm. subject, subjectivity. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, Antonio Picon will have a key. A discussion on that, uh, uh, which is subjectivity right now mm -hmm. in the design. What mm -hmm. is the authorship and subjectivity? Because yeah. a computer uh, uh, algorithm actually be uh, a certain kind of uh, uh, creativity right now. We should collaborate with so this. This kind of the images, biological, new biological images. It's not from the gene already exists. It's totally something new. That's by the way of the noise of the so I my bet would be and I mean, I, yeah again you know this is just my guess that um, that the whole categories of managing that information that's known as noise should become a lot more developed and more sophisticated and to reflect different kinds of mutations and changes uh, that that exists. Um, in the biological world, and that's really how these lives are made. Yeah. Well, I think in the pedagogy and um, methodology in China, probably it's, it's the, whole, the whole studio system actually, what we're missing compared to the Western, uh, I think it's, it's more uh, on the philosophy part. Because mm -hmm. we, we, we pick another things that already existed, just, just doing the same things, the same criteria. If you see the, the, the all the, the panels outside, I think it's in, uh, we need some critical thinking, rethinking on how to create. So formalism sometimes is important. Formalism is related nothing to mm -hmm. the social process, but actually sometimes we should have well, a new, new, new possibility and new creativity. Mm -hmm. I think uh, 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 the noise you mentioned is something different. If, 
And why we, we make a lot of research on 3D printing technology actually. And uh, we this morning we have a meeting with uh, uh, some professors from Tsinghua uh, coming to Tongji, and we have a discussion on that topic. Interestingly, why 3D printing? Because this kind of genetic creativity, or this kind of weight of the images, mm -hmm. the noise of the images, uh, this kind of form itself will need some new production methodology mm -hmm. to produce. So that is the onological part of things. Is maybe and then go more down to the the context of the city, the culture, to develop things. That's just the mm -hmm. second layer of things. But sometimes we need to go deeply directly to the what is center of the problem. This mm -hmm. is the onological part. Of the there's a, there's a much older discussion between Darcy Thompson, who's a British biologist, who's almost a contemporary to Charles Darwin. Darwin basically has a functionalist theory and saying that if you something can work well, then it will survive. And Darcy Thompson has a, said that it's, it's not quite right. A lot of things in the world are actually form-based, uh, that then they develop a structure around the form, like, I don't know, a crack or something, you know? Um, so that's really... Uh, it's it's pretty interesting. I think these are kind of new theoretical issues that are opening up for us to think about. And I think in your field of historic preservation, uh, I really thought that that's another field, memory, city memory. There's another field <laughs> that's completely kind of thrown into a bit of a fluid state, you know, like. Um, and thinking about all this, you know, biology, in a way, biology, you know, like, like uh, Giuseppe Longo says, you know, um, biology is history, right? So what is the kind of history that, that, that is in biology? Um, it's certainly not historic preservation. And your genes carry probably millions of years of kind of genetic development in your body. It's historical, but nothing is preserved as such, you know, like no other species preserve relics. So I, you know, I'm not really kind of saying, uh, anyway, you know, what I'm saying is that it's actually quite, uh, quite a kind of, quite a interesting time for us to think about um, knowledge, but a whole range of issues in architecture. Yeah, form, function, uh, memory, history, and so on. Yeah, this yeah. got a question at the back. Hello, I think that might be just for recording. Hello. Oh, all right, anyway, uh, thank you so much for your amazing lecture uh, because um, I learned biology in the high school, <laughs> and uh, that was the last time I learned biology. But I used all of my algorithms, I used the AI technology on a daily basis. I've uh, never looked at AI to learn biology. So, in this lecture, like, you know, kind of you opened my eyes on this, on this lecture. And uh, I've got two questions, and the uh, should I ask both of them at once or you go one by one? One by one, maybe. Yeah. One. No, 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 one by one. one. Oh, okay. First one is because you said that uh, people like human, like homo sapiens, human beings have tendency to be truthful. But uh, right now, our current algorithms, they don't have that tendency, right? Uh, Moreover, you said, like, in towards the end of your speech, you said, the algorithms to do like like microbial assembly. So the question is, what if the algorithms we have right now are already they are behaving like microbial assembly, but in the very early stage, what if the microbial assemblies in the very early stage they had the same behavior like we like our algorithms they have now? Because I believe uh, microbial assemblers didn't have truths in the beginning of forming. So, what if they are currently already behaving like microbial assemblers, but 
That's very, very interesting <laughs> question. I, I, I think I would say that you, uh, it, I want, it's really, I, I don't think there's a kind of yes or no answer. And I would say that, yes, I agree with you that the algorithms are actually in the beginning of the stage and because the data is accumulating at a vast speed and we don't know what the next generation of chat GPT is, being, is able to do and, and so on. But I do want to argue against the state, the, the, the suggestion that there's no truthfulness in, in, in bacterium. There is. Bacterial reproduction is actually quite truthful. It doesn't, it doesn't lie. It actually is based on genetic information. Yeah, which is, yeah. Algorithms, uh, I don't know. The, the key here, what we have to understand that is actually the idea of entropy, that, that the bacterium uh, dies, yeah, and reproduces. And how do we actually, I mean, I don't really have any answers in that sense, you know. Uh, so, so I think it's possible that, you know, with our newer understanding of noise or more sophisticated understanding of noise, we might be able to build in some kind of weighting of energy and entropic factors uh, into the algorithm that then brings it back to truthfulness. It's possible. Maybe he will do it. <laughs> the second question. Yeah, all the truth. Yeah. So if algorithms don't have tendency, what if feed them with their religion. As we know, religion pushes us to be true. I feel very difficult to answer that question because it's really not in my comfortable territory. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, that religion is about truthfulness. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, but I don't want to make, I, I really don't want to make a statement on that. I think truthfulness is really related to uh, exact copies of DNA information. That's what I meant. Yeah. Uh, uh, in addition, um, religion is a uh, some kind of acculturated function of the continuation of kind of biological structure uh, in the world in, this, in the sense that it really protects uh, the possibility of continuation uh, of a certain uh, species. This is us. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really tough question. Very good questions. I think I, I, I want to give a comments to a question. I think um, the question is totally human centric based on the key <laughs> yeah. religions. But actually, those the post digital era is both human and non human. So when you want to make a uh, judge for what is true or fake, I think it's so they should redefine what's the subjectivity. Mm -hmm. The subjectivity could be not human centric anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the, the question I think we, we can think about. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, this question over there. Yeah. 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 So, uh, at least you know what kind of that the same by the the part of the 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 part of 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 and that takes uh, me to uh, uh, Owen Schrodinger, um, who I introduced in, in, um, in the lecture, uh, who was a 
physicist and was not a biologist, but then take, took biology. Actually, in his time, biology was seen not to be a, it's almost like a second rate science, you know, it's not a prominent science and not like today. Um, but he didn't really think about that and he just took an interest in really thinking about uh, the question of answering from a um, kind of factual, truthful uh, basis um, what life is. So it really began even without the contemporary research in, in biology and cell bi biology uh, to understand what, what life is. And we are interested in that, and me and you know many of my colleagues in, in critical theory uh, and history and theory of architecture is, is really because uh, algorithms are so lifelike, uh, then they really prompt you to think, what is it? You know, is, is this machine life? And what, what makes it work? And then for that to happen, and you have to go into biology, and you know, like um, I would say that biology would be the new emerging uh, um, kind of profoundly influential area of research uh, in theory. You know, you said that you know in, in late twentieth century it was deconstruction. Uh, in in today's world, it would be biology. I would I would I want to say that. You know. David. David. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so my question is largely regarding um, I think it's largely regarding you know, the point of mechanics. Yeah. Um, um let me just pull up a slide real quick. Um, um in the in the slide like to talk about the reversal. Uh, even though it's mm -hmm. seen with a stop for the reversal of entropy through ingestion and uh, absorption. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in my understanding, uh, yes, we do kind of achieve this negativity through this means, but we have to do this at the expense of promoting more than when we eat it after we eat yeah. and exercise it after self, uh, yeah. self yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, of meditation. Yeah. But yeah. we break down that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Further yeah. yeah. Um, in my in my opinion, this is something that from our human perspective, it is an adequate to it can have to be like self or meditation, but in the wider perspective, you know, say that say the great challenge of climate change or you know, the earth being a somehow low flow system reaching it yeah. back yeah. um, up the capacity. In this sense, could and uh, could reversing energy in uh all of them, you know you know could like a a a, a goal of the uh be um you know uh, minimizing um you know yeah, but yeah, excellent observation. I really, yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, yes, it is. You know, like for uh, for some organisms to reverse entropy, and you have to end up organisms in order to do that. But the idea was that there was there has been enough resources to do that. And there has been an ingenious invention of a kind of uh, microbial life that can convert oxygen. Actually, when oxygen appeared in the photosynthesis, it killed off most of the um, uh, ba uh, bacteria on Earth. But somehow one miraculous thing happened that then made that, you know, that cell to actually metabolize uh, oxygen. Oxygen is very, very poisonous uh, for a lot of bacteria. That's why you put your beddings in the sun uh, or, or in the air to really kind of you know, kill off uh, bacteria. Uh, so, so, so I think, uh, I think the, well, I guess, you know, there has been sufficient resources uh, to sustain but then I think we have become 
this, this is really what Bernard Stiegler is worried that, that the speed, maybe a little bit Paul Barillo, that the speed with which we are able to introduce uh, uh, consumption of uh, those life sustaining resources that have increased so much that, that we are indeed in danger. Uh, so that's really kind of a biologist's take on environmentalism. Um, but, but I think we should be a little bit more factual and more kind of coming into the whole picture of understanding what life is and being able to kind of take that maybe to reframe or add some weighting to uh, maybe it's an entropy weighting. You know, I, I don't know what could that be, uh, but, but it would be interesting to think about a, a entropy noise in the algorithm. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That was really well. Thank you so much for coming out on Sunday evening. This is highly unusual, <laughs> but uh, um, but I really enjoy it. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you uh, so much to Professor Li Shisha. I think gave us a, uh, I think this great lecture and uh, I think this special moment. Uh, including the, the climate change, including the economic uh, challenge, I think, and also the culture and the, uh, the war in the, in the world. So that's why the topic this year is emerging counterism canter for the digital futures, I think, give us a new opportunity rethinking on the theory, on the practice, on the pedagogy, I think, to uh, the architecture. Uh, uh, in our school and in our practice. I think, uh, thanks a lot uh, to uh, Professor Vichichia for give a profound thinking and very deep, interesting, uh, amazing lecture tonight. So thanks a lot to his coming uh, offline uh, to Shanghai. It's a really special uh, gift to us. So thanks a lot to Professor Vichichia. Good night to everyone. Uh, I have some questions on